Okay. Hello, all who are on the call. We're going to kind of hang out for about a minute or two to let uh, everyone sign in, and then we'll get rolling. To all who've just logged on, uh, we're going to wait in for one more minute uh, before we start rolling with the webinar for today. Okay, looks kind of like the attendees have stopped rolling in, so we'll get going. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today um, uh, with our first series, our first episode in the series on sustaining the human weapon system and U.S. special operations. I'm excited to introduce Joe Dank. Joe is an applied sports scientist and strength and conditioning coach in the tactical human performance setting. Joe received his undergraduate in kinesiology and exercise science from the University of Illinois and his master's degree in exercise science from the University of Georgia. I'm gonna give you some space there, Joe, to say go, go Bulldogs. Go Dogs. Um, <laughs> uh, Joe's knowledge and experience as a strength coach uh, has shaped his ability to leverage data and technology to make informed decisions. I've known Joe now for 10 years and I had the fortune of working with Joe for four years. On top is Joe's impressive resume. Joe's a voracious reader. Sometimes Joe's reading up to three to five books at a time. Joe is the closest person I've ever met who kind of falls into that polymath, you know, um, type of person. Joe, I really appreciate your time to sit down and chat with us today. Uh, and, and thanks again. Is, is there anything else that you would like to add before we get rolling? Well, thanks for the kind intro, intro Tom. And um, thanks for really having me on. I'm excited to speak today. Uh, first and foremost, though, I just got to say, uh, these are my personal views and opinions. They're not the official views of the DOD, um, SOCOM, um, or um, NSW. I'm not endorsing any product or company today. I'm just talking about merely how I might use these systems in my own personal practice. So, and I'm, I have no conflict of interest to report. Wonderful. Um, I appreciate that, Joe. Uh, so could you give us a quick little summary of your career? And additionally, how and why did you decide to get into this industry? Yeah, I think this is something I think about and reflect on a little bit, because um, where I was in high school was a completely different career track. I was going to be a lawyer. Um, that's what I wanted to do. I was a huge history nerd, loved law. And then 9-11 um, happened my senior year. So I heard the call to serve. Um, I wound up joining the military um, and serving. And one of the roles I had in the military is called a physical readiness uh, coordinator. I think they have a different term for it now. And I would train and coach people with minimum education or resources. And one of the things that drove me crazy was why did somebody improve and somebody didn't? Even though I was in good shape and I had great scores and I was giving this person the same training program that I had, how come they didn't adapt to it? How come they didn't reach their performance milestones the way that I was? Uh, we had a sign over our gym on uh, the ship I was attached to, and it said, a good sweat is your best bet. And I think about that a lot because it's really not true for performance. Um, but that was the guidance we had back then. So after serving five years, doing a couple of deployments, I got out. Um, I want, I figured there's this, I discovered there's this whole big field related to exercise science and strength and conditioning. I had no idea it existed previously. Um, so I got my uh, undergrad at Illinois, my master's at Georgia, because I wanted to understand the why behind training response. I really wanted to understand the science of why people adapt. Um, after that, I went, had the um, privilege of being the head strength coach at the Joint Forces Staff College in a program um, called the SHAPE program, which was the Sustaining Health and, uh, and Performance Endeavor, uh, where I got to coach groups and individuals of everybody, all different officers from all the different branches. It was a really challenging assignment because we had all different performance needs in orthopedic history. 
Um, after I did that for a few years, I was fortunate enough to get hired on to my current position, my current command, where I've had the privilege of working alongside an absolutely incredible interdisciplinary human performance team for the last 10 years. Nice. And well, I hopefully, you. hopefully through this conversation, we can figure out what that why is, why, why people don't change. Um, because if you have that answer, I think all of us want to hear what that is. Still um, changing, brother. Yeah, I think, I think we all are chasing it. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've known you for a while um, and, you know, just talking about your resume there, your, your role has evolved over the last 10 years uh, of your experience. Can you talk about kind of um, how it's transformed and, you know, going from a kind of a researcher, as I remember when you were in grad school, to working in that setting with the joint staff to where you are now? Like, how has that role changed? What has changed inside of you? What have you learned along that process? Yeah, it's interesting. When I look back, I, I see my career, like I wouldn't recognize where I am now. I think that's probably true for most people who are in that situation. After 10, 15 years in the field, they look back and they go, wow, you know, either I was a, I'm a way better coach now than I was then, or what I'm doing now in scope is way greater. And that's, that's certainly, I think, true in my circumstance. So when I was originally hired um, at my current command, I started off as just a strength and conditioning coach, you know, and my primary duties was coaching, coaching groups, coaching um, individuals, a lot of programming, more programming than I had ever done. My previous job, I was a lot of coaching and hardly any programming. And then in this current role, it was a lot of programming heavy. So I had to really evolve into being somebody who could write hundreds of different individual training plans a year um, and still make them coherently make sense for the overall mission and intent, what we're trying to do. A lot of education and a lot of assessment. And then um, I took a change back in 2017 where um, I stood up and became the manager of our applied sports science department. So had some new resources coming in um, to our current command, had great opportunity to really invest heavily in applied sports science and really jump into that field, just head on and embrace all the challenges and all the opportunities it presents. It involved um, designing and implementing an athlete management system, um, implementing our recovery science protocols, uh, working with outside partners on applying research and bringing that information in, standing up assessment technology that we hadn't had previously, um, and then really coordinating research, but then also, and most importantly, uh, learning how to disseminate and communication um, in an immediate and actual way to both the guys that I was coaching and also to the interdisciplinary HP team. And so I did that for five years as, a, as a, another aspect of my job. And then in 2022, towards the beginning of last, last year now, 2022, um, I kind of took over as our head of human performance data science. So another layer to the portfolio. And I think what I appreciate about sports science and data science is they span multiple domains. They cross over strength and condition and they cross over performance nutrition. They cross over across all the domains. They're, they're really, truly interdisciplinary. Um, and what that helped me do is to analyze multivariate HP data sets from disparate sources, bring all that information together, um, lead a data science team, and then figure out how to roll those metrics up into intelligible um, return on investment and measure of effectiveness briefs so we can communicate the value of our program, garner more resources, and really help to understand where we're doing well, where we can get better, um, and how that really impacts our whole program. And I think each step has helped me grow in my leadership capabilities, my ability to communicate with team members and leadership and the guys I coach, and also has really helped me grow as scope as a practitioner because each one of these levels is just an additional tool in my tool belt. Well, I, you know, I think what my, caught my eye there or my ear there first was, you know, how you were programming for single programs for about 100 um, uh, service members. And I'm guessing that might have been, uh, you know, we're going to get further into this today, but that might have been the first time where you were like, hey, I can leverage some technology here, here versus just, you know, doing it by, you know, buying hand. Um, and then it seemed, like, it seemed like there was kind of a theme for each step that data and technology were growing more in your, your, uh, in your daily practice. So it's kind of going to bring, that's going to bring me to the next question here is, you know, you were doing that. But you were, I, you know, since I've known you, uh, you've always been an early adopter of uh, integrating technology in your daily practice. Um, you know, what was the signal that you saw that you were like, you know what, I need to go down this path of, you know, trying technology uh, and, and embedding it into my daily practice? What, what was that signal? I think the signal was I wanted to get better at my job, right? So I think that whether we're talking about being a better coach from a 
from a practical a technical perspective or whether we're talking about using data or whatever we're trying to leverage in our process, it's all about getting better, about having better results, um, about not being complacent um, and, and really trying to be an early adopter in a sense that innovation really helps drive future progress. So one analogy I like to think of when I want to have these conversations with peers and colleagues is, you know, like if you often hear in, the, in our business, like if it's don't broke, don't fix, don't fix it, right? If it's not broken, don't fix it or um, things of that nature. And I don't know if I necessarily believe that. And, and the reason is, I think truly passionately inside of me is that innovation um, only comes from, from pushing the bounds. Like if you just accept where the status quo is, it's good enough. You're, you're not ever going to get better. If that was the case, the Wright brothers would have never invented a plane because we had plenty of ways of transporting ourselves. You know, we would have never had the uh, automobile, um, the Henry Ford figure out a way to bring the automobile to all Americans, right? Because we had ways of traveling before then. The horse and buggy worked fine. It was good enough, right? Innovation comes from pushing those bounds within reason and not recklessly, right? But um, I think that's where I can look at data in my process or technology. It could be transformative for a program and for an individual as a coach. Um, it helps to add context. It helps to remove some of our own biases, especially if we use it the right way. But I think the thing I'll stress here is that there shouldn't be this conflict between using data and technology and relationships and coaching. I view these two as a marriage, um, a symbiotic relationship between the two, if you will. We should be able to do both. And I think your best coaches and practitioners are doing both. They're not sitting in the camp that says, I'm only a coach on the floor and that's all I'm going to do. I'm never going to look at anything relating to data because I know everything. That's ridiculous. In the same sense that if you're only ever looking at data, you don't take the time to forge relationships, to hone your technical skills as a coach, to go out and actually apply those things in the weight room, in the facility, in your practice, in your command, whatever you're doing, you're missing the point there too. It needs to be a blend of both, an interaction approach, if you will, both of those things in order to get the most out of it. So I, I often have a lot of these talks where it's you run into one camp or the other. And I really do think it needs to be a blended approach where both could coexist and make each other better. As a coach, I should be open to something that makes me better as a coach, right? I should also be open to honing my relationships with the people I work with, right? But it doesn't need to be either or. And I see a lot of that out there. And I don't know if that's a reluctance to, to your point, like to adopt new things, or if it's just maybe struck in, stuck in a rut of how you've done things and you've done a good enough job for your whole career where you don't need to change. And maybe that's okay. Right. For me personally, though, going back to your question, um, it's not. I think it's made me a better coach. Um, and I try to use that data with my relationships and with my technical coaching as much as I possibly can. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you and I have sat around and had hours of nerding out, you know, after work. And, you know, we always talked about that tinkering piece of, you know, you, you know, whenever you find something, it's not just you're going to innovate it. It's not going to happen that one day. You're going to have to play around with it. You're going to have to tinker with it. And I think, you know, kind of your question, you know, answer about how maybe certain coaches aren't utilizing technology is I think they, there may be um, some, some fear in that tinkering piece. And, you know, somehow we have to figure out what the incentive is to, to get them to tinker more often and, and to play and to have fun like they, you know, which is what got them into coaching. Um, yeah, so, I agree with you on that. I think there's also like in our field, as you know, like um, the ratio is terrible. The days are busy. Sometimes you're just trying to get through the job. I could certainly appreciate that. Like you got so much work to do. Do you really have an hour to invest? I've been fortunate to have multiple leaders who have, have run our program who have given me bandwidth. And I'd yeah. be remiss if I don't thank them. If I didn't have the bandwidth from my bosses and the support of them over the last 10 years, I wouldn't have had the ability to kind of adopt some of these things. I wouldn't have been able to look at them. I would have been too consumed in my daily practice, right? Of just yeah. getting through the day's work and meeting the intent of the end user. Um, so I think that's some of it too, but I think it's a complicated issue. And I, if you're out there and you're, and you're hesitant, I think thinking about like if one of these tools or systems or ways of thinking about using data could make you better. If you already have a ton of experience, it's only going to be a force multiplier for you. It might be yeah. a new skill to a degree, but bring, bring out all that internal greatness you have as a coach or a practitioner and help apply it in maybe a way that you have more reach. Um, and I think that's one of the things data can do for us as well as give us more reach. Yeah. I mean, the scalability of, you know, be able to interact with more people, um, whether that's through assessment, different types of assessments, or, you know, even, um, you know, workout creators so that people can access it through their mobile device. 
Uh, so kind of down that, you know, adding to that, when you see a piece of technology, what is your philosophy on choosing a specific uh, actual like specific type of technology or a device? Like, and how do you implement that? Kind of like a kid in a candy store, Tom. <laughs> um, I think that we've, uh, and I say that jokingly because in the past we were like that. We saw and bought everything we possibly could. Um, part of it was like a, a need to stay out on the edge to make sure we weren't missing any great capability. Um, others was a need maybe sometimes to kind of uh, just collect in some ways, right? And we, I think we've really kind of learned from some of those practices early on that we had in our, in our program and we've grown from it. I think now we, we think about things a lot more critically and a lot more prudently before we go ahead and procure something. We want to have a plan in place. Um, we want to know that the capability that the system we're adopting truly makes our program better. And it also fits within our culture or ecosystem. So there are tons of systems and technologies out there that are phenomenal that vendors contact us on all the time, but they're never going to fit where I work. So it's not a good fit to adopt it. I'm wasting the vendor's time. I'm wasting money by procuring it. I'm wasting our staff's resources by trying to force people to learn how to use it. So I think we spend a lot of time thinking, does this system bring something to the table, the table and does it fit culturally within what we're trying to do as a program and a command? The next big thing we think about is, does it provide some type of immediate and actionable information? Or is the amount of squeeze that's required to get some kind of meaningful juice out of it so long, so hard, that it's never going to really work? It's not scalable, right? It's not immediate. If I have to go and download data and two days later, I can make a report that's two days old, um, it doesn't really do us any good. And we ran into a lot of those issues. Again, these are lessons learned and they're things that a program has to go through in our setting to learn them. And I wouldn't expect any program to know from day one, um, kind of our lessons learned. Uh, technology should make our jobs more efficient. So we look for efficiency as something that we truly value. Um, the user, inter that's a user interface all the way down to the data sourcing, how you get data out of it, right? Um, how many button clicks are involved in a process, what the time is to use a system. Um, and then after that, we tend to leverage a lot of external resources and labs uh, where we have partners who really help give us a true sense of um, um, independent validation of the technology. Is it valid? Is it reliable? Is it telling us what we think it's telling us, what the vendor's telling us, um, so that we truly have a sense, we're not a lab, we're not going to test that stuff in-house. We're going to rely on other resources we have to tell us those things to make sure that we're not barking up the wrong tree and using bad data in our analysis or our systems. So we rely on that. And then the, the last piece is, is it sustainable and is it scalable, right? If it's so expensive that we can't possibly look to implement it all the time, it's probably a no starter. The same regard, if it's something that only caters to 2% of the population, it's probably not um, scalable enough to have a big impact across our, our command enterprise. And let's not go ahead and adopt it. So that's really how we've kind of looked at this. And my perspective is, it has to kind of check all those boxes. Even if one of those boxes isn't checked, uh, we're not really gonna invest in, we don't do as much R&D as we used to do either. So we used to do a lot of evaluation. Now we've kind of outsourced that to other, other labs and independent measures like that. So we're not trying to test things out anymore. We wanna bring things in that are gonna have an impact. So does the criteria, I mean, you kind of had that philosophy, which is scalable, but does the criteria for um, depend on a use case? So for example, a one-on-one -on -one interaction, the type of technology used for that versus high volume exchanges like testing or group coaching? Yes, um, absolutely. I think every coach would tell you that certain things work better in one area, certain things work better in another. That being said though, they still got to hit those criteria that we talked about, right? So uh, a couple of examples like um, velocity-based training devices and strength and conditioning mobile apps, two things that we use a ton of in our program. In my opinion, as a coach, they work much better in an individual one-on-one -on -one session where you have an individual using that application or using that training sensor with a coach to providing the programming or providing the feedback on the floor in the moment of training in terms of VBT. Um, that works really, really well. When we've tried to scale that to groups, it breaks down especially in our setting. A team sport might be a very different animal in this case, right? Where you have more control of the setting, you have more team buy-in. It's not really how things work with us. It's very individualistic um, due to the nature of the tactical community. I think that's pretty um, true across a lot of different tactical groups. And some of those systems don't work, work well. Like we, when we do large groups, we use whiteboards. 
right? Even though we have access to the technology, just because every time we've tried to apply that technology from like a mobile app in a large group, it breaks down, it slows it down. There's connectivity issues. Somebody doesn't know the press of button. Um, so we've tried to keep that to more very small groups or, or tons of individuals. And it's been extremely successful in that regard. I think the other big thing too is you got to have staff buy-in on these things too. So if you're trying to roll something out across your coaching staff in a, in a coaching environment of large groups and your coaching staff doesn't want anything to do with it and hasn't had any input in it, you're probably going to be met with uh, a lot more friction and reluctance to adopt, right? So um, we try to get a lot of staff buy-in. We try to get feedback on all these things beforehand and figure out like, what are our use case scenarios for this technology? This is going to be used in this setting versus that setting. And we're not perfect. And yeah. So. yeah. And, you know, kind of follow up on that, you know, um, in the tactical world, uh, you know, we're surrounded by the operators who are all very intelligent, driven human beings who want to make themselves better on their own. How do you deal with a situation when one of the operators brings you technology? Like, hey, this is the greatest thing ever. Joe Rogan talked about it. Like, how are we going to manage that? Uh, how do you deal with expectation management there? And um, you know, there's, there's definitely a signal coming from them by them bringing it to you. So, you know, again, how do you work with those situations? I think that's a great question because it happens all the time. Uh, we get people all the time who send us a text or an email or walk into office with the newest app or sensor or podcast or whatnot. I think first and foremost is you, you want to let them know that you have their best interest in mind. Right. You're an impartial player in this and the fact that you're not making money off any of the systems that we're using or not using um, and that you really want to make sure they're not being led astray by some seductive advertisement by a vendor. Right. I often then turn to what I know about that from an education perspective. What have I either seen in the literature, seen in the science relating to it? Is it plausible um, or what I've heard from our independent validation studies done in labs? Right. And I've tried to use that data in that conversation too. Hey, I know you really like this sensor, but I could show you a report that shows that its validity is only like 65%, right? And the analogy I like to use then is like, do you want to look at your bank account and know what's actually in your bank account? Or do you want to be off by 40%, right? Yeah. If you're going to make decisions off of it, especially. So try to educate guys on that. End of the day though, like sometimes guys are going to do what they want to do. You can give them the best education you want. You can have a great rapport with them and they're going to make a decision you don't agree with. And you got to be okay with that. And you still got to be open to them coming back, asking for more information. And over time, you hope to turn the needle on that and influence it. And we're not going to buy things for individuals anymore. We stopped doing that. We buy things for the program, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something we kind of stomp our foot on is, hey, I know you like this gadget. It doesn't fit in our programmatic philosophy. This is what I can tell you about what I know about it. This is what we are using, why we believe it's valuable, why we believe it provides accurate, immediate, and actionable information. And we have access to that if you'd like it. Yeah, that's great. Um, so kind of a final question here before uh, we open up questions to the audience. Um, it's probably the question why everyone's on this, on this call is, uh, can you speak to your current workflow with data and provide some examples of how the data goes from collection into the actual information decision process, which is, you know, this is the million dollar question here. Um, yeah, it's a great question. And it's something that's constantly evolving and very multifaceted. So I think from a philosophy perspective, I kind of have this principle I call the three A's of sports science. Um, data should cause awareness, right? It should be actionable, meaning that we could use it in the moment. And it also should be used to help with assistance, meaning be a problem solver, right? Trying to solve specific performance, recovery, injury related problems. So that's really how our system is structured. So um, if that makes sense to you, we, we have a um, daily sports science dashboard. So essentially I have an, we have an athlete management system that we use that pulls in this data. We look at sleep, physiology related to recovery, subjective wellness, um, training loads, both external and internal. And we try to do a lot of what we call objectively measure and then subjectively qualify that information. So I'm trying to pair variables as much as I can from an objective source, like a sensor, along with some type of subjective rating from the actual user. And what I look for is trends against the person's norms. So we look at a lot of Z-scores and, and shifts from baseline and things like that that try to flag us and alert us. So we have some dashboards set up that are like a daily monitoring dashboard. So I can look through everybody 
see who's lit up, especially who's lit up across multiple parameters in those same areas, right? And then that forms the ability for me to then provide a report for the HP staff or have a conversation with that user or send them a message or a recommendation. In addition to uh, our athlete management system as a system of alerts that's set up as well. So it's automatically reading this data based upon the thresholds that we have set. And when it's tripped for a certain amount of days, it's going to provide a set of recovery resources um, through our athlete management system app that tells the guy, hey, these are the best types of recovery tools based upon the literature to help turn the needle the opposite direction. So really, again, trying to make that immediate and actionable. Um, we also have dashboards that kind of look at the training response. So load response monitoring, as well as uh, we have some dashboards set up to monitor the fitness fatigue cycle, um, and then longitudinal trends of performance and training load markers over time. And that's super valuable as a strength coach, because when I sit down to have a consult with somebody, that's the first thing I'm looking at. What were our recovery trends last month? What were our loading trends? Where was our training consistency? We talk about that all the time in the field. Training consistency is so important. I want to see it on a chart. I want to see how many times you train. I don't want to ask a guy, how was your training consistency? And get an answer like, oh, it was okay. I want to see it. I want to see how that differs from what it was the month before. What's our loading trend? What phase are we in right now? What are we trying to accomplish? And as a coach, it helps because I could compare that to assessment data and it acts as a GPS, right? Mm -hmm. If I give a guy a certain stimulus and a load and he recovers from it, he should go a certain way in assessment data. If he doesn't, Something interfered with that process. Was it a lack of recovery, too much accumulated fatigue? Maybe I didn't do my job as a coach perfectly. Maybe I gave him too much or too little load or not enough in this area or that area. Maybe he didn't do the training. All these things act as contextual cues that we can manage with dashboards, pulling in this data automatically from these different sources and sensors and applications and putting it into integrated dashboards where we can view this over time. It's been a game changer for us in terms of how we could program how we can look at what's happening across trends and how we can disseminate information to the team, our HP team, as well as our users. Um, and then also the last piece is like more immediate tools, um, using data to draw to drive auto-regulatory response protocols and using things of that nature, using things like velocity-based training or heart rate sensors. Those are not very sports science-y from a global perspective, but sports science isn't about the tech. It's about the context of the data and using it to make decisions and providing feedback. Right. So those tools are our arsenal that you could use in the moment of coaching, looking at heart rate response during training as an internal indicator, looking at velocity based metrics as external indicators in the moment of coaching to help provide your experience to then give that guy a better training session that helps him to adapt better. So kind of going back to our when we first started the conversation today, you were saying how, you know, uh, technology can in, improve your coaching. So, um, you know, I've seen you do this, but, you know, this is more, you know, a question to you is like, how do you use all this data to actually build those relationships with the, the, the operators you're working with? Because it seems like that context doesn't, you know, if that guy is, didn't do the program this month, you, it gives you the probability to have a conversation with them and figure out why. What, did they just have a baby? You know, it provides that. So could you speak, please speak about how you actually talk to the data to the actual operator? A variety of different ways, right? Sometimes it's face-to-face -face where the guy's sitting in my office and we're having a console. We're talking about his next training phase of training. And I pull it up. I pull up these analysis dashboards right there and we look at it together. And we point to these things and we see his notes that he might've left on this or that. Or we look at, hey, these are the recovery tools you've used and this is the response. And then you get the feedback from the guy. Oh yeah, I, I have done a lot of uh, photobiomodulation this month and my knees have been feeling really better. And then you could point to the data where you can look at that right? You could see it. Or yeah, I've been really sloppy this month. I haven't got a lot of training sessions. You can look at the log of training sessions completed and be like, hey, you did only get about 30% of the training done. Do we really need a progression? Maybe we just need to recycle this phase a bit, right? So we could use the data in the moment. Um, I've made some reports that I send out to the guys. I've made reports that are daily to our interdisciplinary HP team. Um, that go to them, whether it be in the rehab clinic or contextualizing performance nutrition biomarkers to add context around the things that those practitioners are holding uh, true and dear. Um, and then also um, through our remote um, strength and conditioning app, I've also sent reports that way. So letting a guy know like, hey, uh, this is what we're seeing in these trends. This is where we've shifted over the last month or 60 days compared to your baseline norms. All these things have been built into the system to allow us to provide that feedback at a higher level. And some guys don't want it, 
I'll be honest. Like some guys, they you don't have the relationship to stand on there. They don't want to listen to your data. They just want their next training program. Um, others, it, especially when you explain how it's impacting your process, like if we're looking at you know, um, assessments off the of kinetic data, off the of force plates, and we're saying, this is why I added these movements to your training program, or this is why I'm adding a little bit extra zone two aerobic work this month because of our trends in heart resting, heart rate, and HRV. Guys respond well to that. Oh, he's using this information to make my program better for me. And to that generally keeps the guy coming back, eating for more, bought in, they get better results, they feel better. At that point, you, your relationship in the data has that person hooked on using human performance services to make them a better, uh, to improve their physicality and recovery. And does that data that you have, you're talking about these dashboards, do the operators have access to the same data that you have? Do they have access to their own data? And how do they see that they data? Yeah, so all the various apps have different interfaces. Um, the strength and conditioning app shows them like a global representation of their load, their exercise training history, their changes in estimated 1RM. And then the athlete management system, we have built a um, end user facing dashboard. Right, so they get a 10 day glimpse of their data trend and recommendations across all the variables we're looking at. The difference is on our side, we see months at a time um, and then multiple months at a time over the annual cycles for longitudinal response tracking. Um, so we see a bigger view on our end, but they have that empowered at their fingertips on their phone so that they have some ownership and visibility of their own information and data. So kind of, you know, big, big picture here, it seems like people need to capture more data for us to be able to, to do this. And I, probably a lot of organizations these days aren't even capturing data. They need to come up with a plan to, you know, how, how to capture that data and, and what data they need to look at. Um, you know, you guys have had time to innovate and, and, and to tinker with it. But um, I think data is, you know, a lot of organizations aren't collecting it and they're not going to, be able to make decisions based off of it. And it's going to be mostly heuristics that allow them to make those decisions, which sometimes are not the best thing. Uh, we have a question that came through here uh, and uh, kind of uh, dovetails of what we were just talking about. So how has your strategy of communicating with your athletes changed over time? What is most effective? Data, stories, simplicity versus demonstrating your knowledge. So kind of, you know, we kind of talked about it just with the last bit, but taking the data um, and, you know, come up with a little vignette there of like how you're going to communicate that data with the operator to hopefully make change. I think it's, it's a great question. And it's something that we're constantly trying to get better at uh, every day. I literally try to get better at exactly whoever wrote that question. I think one thing that I've learned is that it's a very individual thing how I approach each guy based upon the relationship, the rapport I have with him is gonna dictate how I come at him with what type of information. There are certain guys I know, high-end users, that they love it. I can give them the data almost in any way imaginable in a queuing or in coaching or in um, program design or whatnot, recovery application, and they're gonna eat it up and follow the recommendation. There are other guys I might have to dance a little softer around it. I might have to figure out this is a little bit more palatable for this guy. What are the things that are important to them? How am I helping them reach their goals with it, their goals with this data? And if you could find that in what's important to them and what makes sense from a programmatic perspective, um, sometimes the data is swallowed a little easier. And we we strike out all the time. There are some guys who um, you know they 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 don't want to listen to any of it. And they'll straight up tell you that, like, hey, I, I really don't care what that says. I'm going to keep doing what I want to do. And at that point, you have to kind of check yourself and say, hey, man, you know, that's cool. I'm here. I'm here for you. Whenever you, you need information on this, if you ever want to talk about it, I'm open to conversation. What can I do to help? Um, and, and other guys will, will listen to every word you have to say on it, and they'll actually follow your suggestions, and they'll improve, and they'll do better. And you got to kind of meet guys where they stand in our community. So I wish there was a, a overall, like, do this all the time type of answer to that, that great question. There isn't. It's really very individual, knowing your audience, who you're talking to. The way I'm going to present data to leadership or my boss is very different than the way that I'm going to present data to a guy on the floor that I'm working with. And it's going to be very different than how I'm going to present data to the interdisciplinary team that I work with. So and uh, the lesson I've learned with that is really trying to engage the interdisciplinary team, asking them what are the things that you care about that you know are important versus initially I went after the things that I thought was important. And uh, one story I'll quickly share is, you know, when I was looking at 
giving feedback to the sports medicine team, I really wanted to get feedback on load, right? Because we know that load is associated with injury. I thought surely everybody in a sports medicine environment would care about training load. And in reality was they didn't. They didn't care about that. They cared more about sleep and recovery response, right? Because they cared more about where I could put that guy in a recovery tool today to help with the rehabilitative process that they're already doing with them, right? Versus maybe an athletic session, they do care more about load. Yeah. But in our environment, it's more about recovery. So like then learning that and, and those nuances and building reports specific to those people um, has really helped with the flow and dissemination and adoption of using data and practice. So I've got another question here. Um, the, the term data science in some places is kind of squishy and in other places it's very tangible. Can you kind of give us your definition of what data science is to you and kind of in, in your context? Yes. So I think there's a difference between data science and sports science, and I'll clarify that first. So I think my definition of my working definition of applied sports science, um, and this is my opinion, is literally bringing the right information to the right people at the right time to make decisions in the moment. Um, it's not about research. I think that is sports science in general, but applied is very much in the moment. Um, and it's about dissemination of information across the disciplines, across the domains um, to help the athlete or the end user. Data science, I believe, is more specific to using scientific knowledge, using the way we think about um, scientific testing on data and information. It spans across the entire program, touches everything, and it's more analytic-based. So it's not really application-based. It's more about discovery and insight um, and running true analysis on information, not really getting feedback in the moment. So I separate those into two different bins. Um, data science is across the entire program. Applied sports science is more about how could I bring information in the moment to the practitioner or the end user to drive decision making right now. That's a wonderful answer. I, I, we need a you need to trademark that so we can we can start selling it. Um, and it's so, not technology either. I'll say that too. Like it's yeah. not technology. The sports science guy is not the technology guy. Technology is a tool that a sports scientist might use to get some type of context to data. But it is not, hey, this is our technology dude, and he's just taking care of all this tech. Tech's tools that a sports scientist might use, but that's all they are is their tools, their instruments. I think that's also an important distinction that's often lost in my opinion. So to kind of wrap this up to now, um, you know, when you said the reason you started this career path is you were wondering why people we're making certain changes by giving the programming and why weren't uh i you know jokingly have you didn't you know have you answered that question but more uh i guess pointed is how do you see how data can now help you with that why is it are you are you closer to understanding it now do you have a better or is it just are you now just have more questions to answer yeah so that's a great kind of closing question tom I think that all of this is really about optimization, right? And optimization is about chasing that half to a 1%, right? An incremental marginal change in performance or recovery or sustainability over time. And when we, when we think about optimization, we should be thinking about, we're just trying to turn over rocks, right? Knowing that every rock we turn over might give us a fraction of a percentage of, of value, but we're never going to turn over all the rocks. Right? We're never going to possibly be able to optimize everything, but we're going to try to do as much as we possibly can. And when we think about um, how we, we tie this all together, the, the, the nature of um, sports science is that you're never going to truly, truly um, to get there. Right. So when we look at how people are responding in data, it's looking at those contextual cues relating that back to what you know about the person, what their goals are, and seeing is the needle moving for that person the way you expect it to. So I think a lot of in terms of the fitness fatigue cycle is I know that like during certain tra uh, training phases, we should be driving up fatigue, right? As we really, really train hard and performance potential is going to go down, right? We could monitor that. We could see is the response as expected. And if it's not as expected, if it's unwanted, can we then use the data and the resources and the service we have at our disposal from an interdisciplinary team perspective? And can we use that to help move the needle the right way, right? So everyone's gonna be different. Data is giving us the context to actually look at this from a global perspective all the way down to the individual perspective and figure out, are we going the right direction, right? It's like a GPS. 
right? Are we going the right way or are we off, lost in left field? And then what do we do to correct that? Without data, we have blinders on there, right? We don't know. We have a relationship. We see the guy, we coach him. We know his squat looks good. He had a good training session. We're friends with that person. That's great. He's valuing us. He's using us. But is he truly moving the right way? Are we truly optimizing this individual? I think data gives us some clues. And we could use that with our relationship, uh, with our relationships and with our subject matter expertise that we've accumulated over our careers to get better answers to a question that we're never probably truly going to understand fully. Good. What a great way to end this webinar. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, everyone else out there, please join us on April, so let's see, April 18th, when I'm going to speak with Chase Phelps. Uh, we can continue our series on optimizing the human uh, weapon system in the special operations. Uh, Joe, again, thank you so much for your time and for all your expertise. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you. And thank for everybody who, uh, who listened to me talk for, for 40 minutes. Have a great night. All right. Bye. Thank you, everyone.